and those who decorated the outside. Uh, take some pictures if it's not raining this morning. Uh, it's just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Dave, you're a camera operator, and you'll give our folks at home a chance to get close up to the tree. So, maybe? <laughs> Maybe we'll do that next week. Make sure they get, make sure they get a good look at it. So. Let us join together in our historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time we will have the lighting of the Advent candle. You may remain seated as there is not a response this time, but we have a family who's going to come forward and light the candle, and they will have a reading to share with you. Thank you. As we light the first Advent candle, the candle of peace this morning, we begin that blessed trail that leads us to Christmas morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the season before us. We thank you for Thanksgiving just celebrated. And we are reminded that we give thanks above all for the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, into our world. Father, through him is, we have true peace. In him we have salvation. In him alone. We have life eternal. And we thank you. Father, this, this season is different here and throughout the world. Father, we know that there are many who are often separated from their loved ones during the holidays. Those in military service, those in travel for business, and for many, many other reasons. Father, that list is much longer this year as COVID keeps families apart in protection of those who are medically susceptible. But we are still united in you. We are still together through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we know that there is nothing that can separate us from that truth and that love. Nothing has ever been able to separate us. Father, in the earliest days of the Christian church, 
They faced great and deadly persecution. That could not separate us. We have faced pandemics and diseases before, and they could not separate us. We have faced challenges from within and from without. And those things could never separate us from your love. So today we celebrate mindful of those who, who cannot be in person in their churches or with their families. But thankful for whatever technology, what opportunity we have to stay connected. And knowing that the most powerful force that this world has ever known, your grace, is enough for all of us in every corner of the world. Fill our hearts. Bring us to the realization of the true meaning of this season. That you are enough for us. Yesterday, today. And through your grace forever. Now, as you have taught us, let's pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Kids, Miss Carrie's coming back. She's coming back. Miss Carrie is somewhere. There she is. Look, there she is. She's coming to lead you in our verse. And then we're going to have something else special for you. All right, you ready? Are you ready? beautiful, isn't it? Is it pretty? But you know what? It's not quite finished. It's not quite done. We have a few ornaments to hang up still. Would you like to help do this? All right. Need you to come up by socially distanced family. So we'll just start up here and work our way back around the, work our way back around the church. And as you pick the ornaments, we're going to talk about what they are. All right? Are you ready? So I want you to take your ornament out and hang on to it for a minute. Miss Carrie's going to help you. Take, take it out and hang on to it. Take one and just hang on to it. And bring it over to me, and I'm going to talk about it, and then you can put it on the tree. Ready? What do you have? All right. What does that look like to you? Let me give you a hint. A fish! That's exactly what it is. It is a fish. The fish has been a symbol of Christians since ancient times. Remember Jesus? 
He fed people with loaves and fishes. Yep, this is a fishes. <laughs> this is a fast fish. This is a slow fish. All right, go ahead and put it on the tree. Here you go. All right, let's see what you got here. This is, what is that? A cross. And we know that is the classic symbol of our faith. Because Jesus died on the cross, and then he rose again, that we would not perish, that we would live, how long we live in Jesus? Forever. Forever. There you go. Forever. All right, let's see what we have here. Okay. Hi there. How are you? All right. We have, what, what do you think this is? Let me give you a hint. It's usually pictured like this. Okay, we'll try this. What? It's a bird! It's a dove. And we have a bird like this. It's usually a dove like this, or sometimes like the Holy Spirit comes down, the dove is like that. But it's a dove. And what does a dove symbolize? A dove symbolizes peace. This is the perfect, perfect ornament for today. Has a cross to remember that true peace comes through Jesus. There's your dove. All right, what else do we have? Let's see. Let's try this one. What do we have here? This looks like a bow tie. It's not a bow tie. It looks like one. You turn it this way. It's a chalice, right? So it's a chalice. It's a cup. It's a chalice. This reminds us of communion. That Christ gave Himself up for us, that we would not perish in everlasting life. He said, "This is my body. This is my blood." And this is a chalice. A chalice is also something a king drinks out of, or a queen. A king drinks out of when Jesus is king. This reminds us that Jesus is king. Here you go. Hey there. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. And you have, what do you think this is? This one's a bit tricky. You know? And it's a musical instrument. Really. It's a harp. It's a harp. Remember how King David in the Bible? King David played a harp. And a harp is a symbol of heavenly music. Reminding us that there's a heaven and that Jesus is there and he's with us too. Angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. There's a harp of gold. All right. Let's see. Oh, this is, this is a perfect one. This is a perfect one for you. What do you think this is? You want to help? What do you think that is? No, no. It's a manger. Say that again. That is where Jesus was. That's where baby Jesus was. All right. If I had a gold star, you'd get one, but I don't have one. So... Here's a manger, so one of our youngest to come up has the manger, and how perfect is that? How perfect is that? All right. <coughs> we help our human tree, and then we'll ask who else we have. Anybody else? Can we get them all? Huh? We got two more ornaments, so who wants to put on two more ornaments? Come on, Johnny, you want to do anybody? Come on. We'll take anybody. Come on, come on. All right. Pick one out. There you go. What is that? It's a crown. It's a crown. There you go. <laughs> Why do we put a crown on the Christmas tree? The Christmas tree. Because Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And this crown, actually, the very top of the crown is a cross. Ooh. Just to remind us. All right, we got one more. And that is? It is a butterfly. Why do you think it's a butterfly? Well, it is a butterfly. Why do we have a butterfly on the tree? A symbol for beauty. That's actually, actually, that's pretty good. I actually like that. Um, that's not the definition I've heard, but then again, it may, may be part of it. A uh, butterfly generally symbolizes new life. You know, the, the little worm goes in the cocoon and comes out something new and glorious. It's a symbol of new life and transformation. But beauty, I actually like that too. I think I'm going to add, I'm add beauty to my description of what the, what the butterfly means. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. We got one more here. I know what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about it. 
I like St. I like St. Patrick's Day, so I kind of this one go. Um, this is on now. Um, this one broke, so we have to fix it. Put the loop back on before we put it on the tree. I thought let's prop it in there. This is a shamrock. Uh, this is a three-leaf clover. Anybody know what this symbolizes? The Trinity, absolutely. Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right. So we'll just uh, sit that next to that on the tree. Okay. There we go. Take it with an ornament repair shop here. Thank you, Mary Sue, for rescuing that beautiful ornament. Our scripture this morning comes. I'll take this off of here. So you can hear me a little better. The scripture this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. We often look to for prophecy. Uh, looking forward to Christmas Day. Looking forward to the Christ walking among us. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, starting with the first verse. Isaiah chapter 9, starting with the first verse. Would you stand for the reading of the word? Nonetheless, those who were in distress won't be exhausted. At an earlier time, God cursed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But later he glorified the way of the sea, the far side of the Jordan, and the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. You've made the nation great, you've increased its joy. They've rejoiced before you with joy at the harvest as those who divide plunder rejoice. As the day of Midian you shattered the yoke, you burdened them, the staff on their shoulders, and the rod of their oppressors. Because every boot of the thundering warriors and every garment rolled in blood will be burned, fuel for the fire. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing it and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces will do this. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. What is the opposite of peace? War. After all, the book is not called War and Joy, War and Hope, War and Love. It's called War and Peace, right? And on a geopolitical scale, uh, that's how we've traditionally, we've traditionally thought of it. In fact, even this passage uses imagery of battle, of, of war. It talks about... Um, it talks about the boot of thundering warriors, every garment rolled in blood, meaning those who are, have been injured or killed in battle. Um, that every, every aspect of war will be gone, and only peace will remain. And that's true. War is obviously antithetical to peace. They cannot exist together. But does the absence of war necessarily mean the presence of peace? No, absolutely. Think of Christ's time. Christ's time was in an in 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 area of peace we call the Pax Romana, basically the Roman peace. Because the Romans had conquered everyone. And they ran everything for hundreds of miles in every direction. Actually, much bigger than that. It's just a, but they, they controlled everything. And so there was, for a time, there was really no one left to fight them. No one strong enough to challenge the Roman Empire. So you had peace, the absence of war. But the people living in Israel, despite the absence of war, they did not have peace. Because they were being controlled by an oppressive government. By a pagan government that worshipped the pantheon of gods. And the true God not being one of them. 
They controlled every aspect of life. And what power uh, the Jewish church had in Christ's day was what power was given to them by the overseeing Romans. There was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of planning against the Roman overlords. There was no war. But there was also no peace. The people were still looking. They were searching. They were waiting for something greater. For the Romans to be gone. For something bigger to be realized. Even though there was no fighting in the country, the land, or the streets. Perhaps the true and complete opposite of peace is fear. It is impossible to be at peace when fear is a part of your life. What does war bring? War brings fear. Fear of death, fear of injury, fear of destruction, fear of territory and kingdoms lost, fear of, your, of will being imposed on you by an armed aggressor. War brings fear. The presence of the Romans brought fear into the heart of the children of Israel. Just as in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the presence of various armed oppressors brought not only physical war, but also great mental anguish and fear to God's children time after time. And Isaiah speaks to that. Isaiah talks about a time when there will be peace, not just peace from war, but peace within each individual heart. For sure, the symbols of war will be gone. The boot of the thundering warriors, the oppressive forces, the symbols and casualties of war, every, everyone will be gone. But look back before, verse 4. As in the day of Midian, you shattered the yoke that burdened them, the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. It's more than the absence of war. It's the burden on the hearts of the people. Isaiah preached during very difficult times and in very difficult circumstances. Legend tells us that he served as an advisor to five kings. Four listened to him sometimes. The fifth had him brutally executed because he could not bear to hear God's truth being proclaimed to him and the people. So Isaiah was no stranger to not only literal war, but to the heavy burdens placed upon the people. Wondering what would come next. Being conquered by people who did not love and worship the true God. Being oppressed and burdened. And weighed down and broken by so many things. By feeling disconnected from God Mostly because of their own disobedience, but nonetheless, feeling the heartbreak of realizing that their blessing had been withdrawn because their obedience had long failed. And longing to be restored. Of seeing the evidence of not having justice in their land. You hear the protesters chant, no justice, no peace. In a land where there is no justice, there cannot be peace. And Isaiah lived that. Under tyrannical pagan kings. Never knowing what decision would be handed down next. Never knowing what persecution, what toil, 
what threat will come. Never knowing even times in the absence of war when war would break out. Isaiah knew the burden of having no peace. But as God's prophet, he was given a picture. He was given an image of a different time. He was given an image of a transformation. In fact, he was given two images. He was given the image of something that would happen relatively quickly and something that would happen 800 years later. He was shown that his people would be temporarily rescued. And brought to a time of absence of war. In Isaiah's day, that was saying a lot. Just to not have to fight. To not have to defend your country and home against violent armed attackers. That was something. That was a huge step in the right direction. But it wasn't the whole route. Isaiah was also shown something again that would happen 800 years after he breathed his last. That someone would come with a new message, with a new power, a power unlike anything the world had ever seen. What did Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians 4? That Christ is not words, he is power. The people have tired, the people have tired of words. They are tired of proclamations against them. They are tired of changing of regimes that happens incredibly rapidly throughout the Hebrew Bible. They were tired of kingly orders to tear down temples, to tear down altars of the true God, and to construct pagan buildings. They were ready for true power. They were ready for the one to bring them true peace. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. And authority will be on his shoulders. A child? A son in a patriarchal society? Of course they get that. Of course a man would rise up. But a child? Authority will be on the shoulders of a child? Historically, very young leaders have not worked out well. Even in some Disney stories, you will see how a young monarch is controlled or manipulated by powerful adult hands. And it happened many times throughout history in real life. So why would they trust a child leader? Why would this be the message for the people? Seeking peace. True peace, not just an absence of war. But what can a child even do about war? A child is born to us. A son is given to us. And authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing it and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces, the Lord of hosts, will do this. And a fair question to ask is where is that peace today? If you ask a Jewish person why Jesus is not the Messiah, he will very likely point to this passage and tell you because the peace for David's house has not yet come. How can Christ be the Messiah when the peace has not yet arrived? 
And I must admit, theologically, it's a powerful challenge. But we know that peace lives in the hearts of those who accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And for a world that will not acknowledge Jesus or God the Father or God the Holy Spirit, who will not even step down that path to say that God exists and instead worship so many other things, how can there be peace in the world? Hearts that do not feel peace cannot exude peace. Souls that are ripping themselves apart from the inside can't calm the hearts and the lives of others. That's part of why Jesus' presence, His physical presence in this world, brought so much comfort to people. Because in Him, there was no deception. In Him, there was no conflict. In Him, there was love and the living power of God. And when people came near that, they could feel that. When people heard His words, they were transforming. And God desires for us to have that same effect upon the world. For our presence as Christians to be calming. To be the man and woman of God in every situation that we are in, regardless of their age. Remember we're talking about Timothy. That Timothy was being sent at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He was a young man. Too young to be taken seriously by some because of his age. But nonetheless, an example to believers. That role has passed to us. That in our words, that in our actions, that in the depths of our hearts, we have a peace that can be felt. A peace that can transform. And it's not hard to see that if the whole world acknowledged that love, Acknowledge that grace, accepted that peace in their hearts, then there would be an absence of war. And so, so much more. There would be an absence of hate and prejudice and fear. And without fear, we would have true peace. Perfect love is in Jesus Christ. And the scripture says perfect love casts away fear. O oh, come, Prince of Peace, into our hearts, into our nation, into our world. Let us pray. Almighty God, as the hymn says, there are always fears within and fightings without, since we assemble last. And so often our hearts are conflicted by sin and the nature of the world. But Father, the same was true in Isaiah's day. The same was true in Adam's day. The same was true in Paul's day. And through it all, you have been there. Calling us to greater. Calling us to higher. Calling us to love and truth and peace. Amen. This time we'll have our prayer for the offering, which you can leave at the plates as uh, we move back out for our final hymn, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel. Uh, we are continuing this week, one more week, to take up a collection from the Louisville Food Pantry. 
Uh, I will not call amount, the amount on the air, but I will tell you, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. But we'll say we can do better. Can we do better, Miss Shirley? Can we do better? We can do better. We can do better. So I encourage you this morning, if you've not done so, to uh, please, please include an offering for the Louisville Food Pantry. If you've already done so, God might be leading you to maybe give a little more. And that is the wicker baskets at, at the front and back of the church are where you place that offering. So right now we will we will pray uh, for both. We'll pray for both offerings. Let us go to the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for everything we've received. We thank you that we can celebrate this season together, this beautiful Christmas tree, this beautiful church with your beautiful people. We thank you. We have indeed so much to be thankful for that one day a year cannot begin to cover it. As we head in this season of anticipation, this is this season of joy, we're reminded that without you, everything we have Everything we are will be, if not non-existent, meaningless. Because our life would end. And our selves would cease to exist. But it is not that way with you. Because your love is triumphant over the things of the world, even over death itself. So for the offering, Father. We ask your blessings upon those who give it for the work of your church in this community and throughout the world. And Father, we know that you've also commanded us to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to care for the sick. And this is one way we can do that, an offering for the Louisville Food Pantry. And Father, we pray for their work right now. That their ministry increase and their effectiveness increase. That they be able to more completely serve enough people that no one in Jefferson County will go hungry. Father, you've already done great things to the food pantry and its leadership. You've done great things for Jefferson County. But Father, we know there's more to be done. Let us be instruments of that action. Let us be a blessing. As we have the rest. In the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You would take your hymnals and turn to page number 204. 204, and stick your finger in there. And after you move past both offering plates in the front back of the church, we'll head outside and we'll sing our closing hymn together. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel. <laughs> 